Peter Mignal uh, for coming here and then uh, want to present the paper. Uh, this is the title of the Formasi Kebijakan Guru Muda dan Guru Pendidikan Nasional Indonesia. Oh, not not this one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the... Uh, it's okay. Okay, the... It's not that one either, so <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> it's not either of them. Okay, so... We will present a series of their findings. Uh, yeah. Four papers. Four, four papers. papers. Uh, that I think is been done. Uh, the survey has been done around 2011 and 2011. Yes, that's right. Uh, in Jakarta. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. So now uh, we have around uh, less than two hours uh, until 4 p.m. Yeah. Uh, and because this is not a big audience, so we yeah. can maybe. Uh, maybe a bit for long, yeah. 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 If, you, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. So if there is uh, any questions yeah. or uh, comments, yeah. maybe we can clarify it uh, along the way. So for the time, uh, and we found the series uh, on the Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, your time here. Um, and the general solution. Thank you. Uh, okay, bahasa Indonesia apa yang disini? Terserah. Kalau Pak Peter Kalau, Well, I'll use half an hour. <laughs> so, uh, we have uh, our survey. It's called the 2010 Greater Jakarta Transition to Adulthood Survey. And uh, the survey is conducted in Jakarta, Bekasi, and Tangerang. Mm -hmm. And the sample is representative. Uh, 3,006 respondents aged 20 to 34 years old. Uh, what happened is that uh, we just uh, launched this book. It's called the Reformasi Kebijakan Penduduk Muda dan Kurikulum Pendidikan Nasional di Indonesia and it's in both languages, uh, in Bapanas, just uh, yesterday, and it was, there was a lot of people. Uh, and in this book, it's, uh, uh, there are 18 chapters, uh, 18 chapters, and we're going to present some of it. Uh, Professor McDonald uh, will present about uh, markers um, of adulthood and then uh, poverty measure as well as uh, education and uh, education education and, um, and and employment outcome of migrant uh, and then I will present about the importance of reproductive health uh, services for those who are still single and and a very descriptive finding about the uh, political affiliation as well as the uh, religious affiliation of our respondent. Uh, so now I, I will just uh, so because this was, we were presenting two surveys, so that book is based on two surveys, but we'll just concentrate on the, on the 2010 Greater Jakarta Transition to Adult Survey. So as I mentioned, it is conducted in Jakarta, Tangerang, and Bekasi. And we have the Kota Madja, the yeah. Bekasi. Bukan semuanya, cuma Kota Madianya. Then, and it's representative sample, 3006. So because we want quality data, so this survey was, was quite expensive. Uh, uh, because we really want to have a quality data and and uh, yeah. Oops, sorry. So after we did the survey, then we also follow up uh, a respondent in 2011. So one year after our survey and we interview them in depth uh, to see about their lives, 
uh, and their pathway when they they are trying to find work, education, and struggle, you know, to the difficulty of lives. And then the case study is presented in in the in the folder that I have given you. And uh, this is our team. So our team is uh, Professor McDonald, Terry, Terry Hall, and the Arian Utomo, and Anara Mundus, that's from ATSRI. This is our core team in ATSRI. And we also work together with uh, Professor Gavin Jones from the National University of Singapore. And when we were collecting the data, we were collaborating with the Center for Health Research, University of Indonesia. And this is uh, the, uh, the funding agency uh, for, our first la for our first round. So we want to make this into a longitudinal study, a follow-up study for 10 years. And uh, in that way, then we know how the life of these young people changes, whether those who are having a good job, whether they can maintain their job, or whether they would move to another job, or whether those who, who isn't very fortunate can, can move to a more better economic situation. Uh, but at the moment, uh, we have we have proposed for the second round of our study, uh, but we don't know the result yet. So we are still we are very nervous at this moment because we want to gather funding uh, to be able to conduct this. And if our second phase survey and third survey is possible, then that would be the first. Uh, study who really look at young people, 20 to 34 years old. And it's such a pity because it's almost 62 million of young people your age. Uh, and a lot of, uh, except maybe the three of us. <laughs> uh, and, but if you think about it, you know, the government doesn't really think about them because the government is giving more priority to those age under five, mother and child, and also teenagers, and now Lancia. So that's why we did this, this study. So, um, so, yeah. So first now, uh, that is, a little bit background of our study, and uh, Professor McDonald uh, will 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 talk uh, first about. Do you want to talk first about the migration or um, or the poverty or? Doesn't, doesn't matter much. <laughs> well, let's do the migrants first. Okay. Yeah. That's the yeah. Yeah. So he's going to first talk about the markers to adulthood. And this is uh, the markers to adulthood is um, is very very different uh, from uh, from literature in the West. <laughs> this professor we can know. Well, we, uh, we called our study Transition to Adulthood, mm -hmm. and so this paper kind of deals with that basic question, what is adulthood and how, what is the transition to, to adulthood? And uh, we, uh, there are essentially four concepts of adulthood. One is a biological, that you reach a kind of sexual maturity, and that's the definition of adulthood from way back many centuries ago. Uh, then we invented the law and there was a legal age of majority, the age at which people can marry or vote or sign contracts, drive a car, etc. It's another concept. 
but uh, the third concept is what was referred to as socio-demographic markers. This is a, that you achieve, you achieve something, and the achievements are you finish your education, you leave home, you start working, you get married or you have children, that they are kind of markers of progression in, in life. Uh, and uh, could be markers of adulthood. And finally, there's a kind of, and particularly in the American literature, a kind of psychosocial, it's a, the sense of in, independence that you think that you're an adult, uh, that you have a sense of independence from your parents, control over your own life, and as some of the American literature says, that you can stand alone, right? So, you know, so yeah, that, that, kind of, that kind of definition. Uh, I'm going to focus on the, the number three and number four here in this paper. There's just a bit of literature there. Uh, the first one, Shanahan et al, that deals with the socio-demographic markers. The second one, Arnott, uh, deals with that psychological approach or uh, uh, conceptions of, of adulthood. But the third one deals with a yet another kind of area of definition of adulthood, that is that you have a sense of control over your life, okay? That you reach the point where you feel that you have control over, over your own life. Uh, and in this paper, the, and in the US rather, there's quite a lot of debate about the salience of the markers versus the independence from parents versus the, your own sense of control. Uh, and we look at that from this. We've got measures of all three of these in this study, and we look at, look at them. So how should an altered be, or can it be defined for young Indonesians? So one of those three, we use the Jakarta survey, as we've already outlined. Why young adults in Jakarta? Uh, it's, why did we choose Jakarta? Uh, we didn't go into that, but uh, uh, we think that young people in Jakarta are subject to a lot of different forces, yeah? as listed there. There's kind of Western individualism forces, there's the Eastern Islamic fundamentalism, there's the modern Indonesian nationalism, and there's the old traditions, the old Indonesia, and the, and the, uh, the Sukhubanks, I would say. You know, all of those kinds of forces, uh, of ideas, uh, and they have to deal with that as well as dealing with their everyday uh, lives, the, the economics of their lives, and we'll talk about that later on. So young Jakartans are, are not isolated in a traditional culture, in quite the opposite. They're living in a very dynamic environment where the pace of change is very considerable. Uh, I first came to Jakarta over 40 years ago. <laughs> it's, a, it's slightly different now. <laughs> uh, right, like very different. <laughs> uh, and uh, today the level of education is really quite high. In our sample, which was a, a carefully selected random sample, uh, taking account that some of them who were age 20 and so on were still at school, uh, and presuming they finish, uh, almost 70% had completed senior, senior high school. That's very high. And 28%, or well, you know, getting up to 30%, we're going to have a tertiary classification. And they're levels which are, you know, if you went took Australia, for example, 10 years ago, probably about the same. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, they're, they're quite high levels of education. All right, well, here's the results for the markers. And uh, going from the bottom, right, going upwards, uh, the bottom one is entering the labour force. Uh, this is males, men. And you can see that, uh, you know, there's a small proportion who are in the labour force already when they're 15. We, we collected a, a full life history of their work. From age 12, we asked their, their education and their work every year, age 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, what they were doing. That's how we got this data. Uh, uh, so it's a full work history, and we'll continue that when we go back to them. We'll keep uh, getting every single year of their lives, and not just the, that they're working, but what their occupation was in each of those years. Uh, so, but they, they really start to go into the labour force from about age 18. Uh, that's when it becomes quite strong. 
And then most males are in the labour force by you know, age 25. So most of them, you know, between age 18 and age 25, most of them have gone into the labour force. So, uh, and you know, that's that's some ways a good candidate for adulthood, I think, and, and that's what we conclude that this is a good uh, a good measure of adulthood that they are actually working and making their own money. Uh, the red one just above, that's leaving the parents' home. And you see that that just changes very gradually uh, through this uh, period, uh, of a linear change. Uh, and by age 34, 20% uh, of them, of these men, are still at home with their parents. Uh, I'm still living with my parents. You're still living with your parents, yeah, yeah. So there you are. <laughs> so if you jumped over. <laughs> You can tell us why. <laughs> uh, but it's not unusual. Yeah. Uh, and then the one above that is the purpley one is marriage. And 25% of Jakarta males at age 34 are still not married, never married. Uh, and uh, they're, they're pretty slow, they're slow getting into marriage as well, as you can see from that curve. Uh, they only reach 50% married by about age 27 uh, so it's pretty they're, they're slow getting married uh, and the final one is is having a birth which looks you know it's just a bit after the, the getting married which is as you might expect so uh, if 25 percent of them have not married by the age of 34 do we say they're not adult because they have not married probably not <laughs> so I don't think it's a very good measure of adulthood to say that somebody, or, or if they're still at home with their parents, yeah, that, that he's not an adult. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off the line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're even past that, I am. <laughs> yeah. But we probably won't say that you're not that old. Uh, <laughs> uh, so there's some, this clearly indicates that there's some problems with using markers, except maybe working for Kircher. Yeah? That's the same thing for, for women, for Kircher. And uh, it shows somewhat similar pattern that the uh, working again is the feature. <laughs> Maybe we'll check the uh, again, more or less between age 18, probably a bit earlier for women, and, and age 25 or so, that's when most of them go into the labour force. Uh, and most of, uh, about 90% of our sample of women have ever worked. Uh, there's 10 percent of them never, uh, uh, by the time they're 35 not, have never worked. But most, almost all of them, 90 percent, have, have worked at some time. Uh, in our other research we've looked at whether they're working now at the time of the survey and it's very much lower than that. You know, the, the proportion working at the time of the survey of women was about 40 percent, even though 90 percent of them have ever worked. Uh, and why? Well, because they had babies, right? That was essentially the reason. And it's very difficult for them to combine, to combine for a lot of them, to combine work and family. We often think that uh, in Indonesia, you know, people can have servants, etc., etc., or there's lots of family around who can look after. Uh, but in Jakarta, that's not the case. Uh, that uh, the, uh, a lot of them were migrants to Jakarta, so they didn't necessarily have family that could look after. Um, and they were too poor, of course, to have servants, the vast majority, because most of them are not particularly well off. Uh, and so they are forced to stay at home when they've got young children. Uh, but again, employment looks like a, a good marker uh, for women as well, potentially, as a, a measure of adulthood. But leaving home, uh, interesting, the red one, uh, is actually ends up as the highest one, that they're, they are more likely to be at home uh, than, uh, than not to have married, so, than, than to be single. So this, this of course means that there's a lot of them that are married who are living at home, uh, that they're, they're at home with, the, with their parents. Uh, but again, you know, if a woman is still at home at the age of uh, 34, do we say she's not adult? No, I don't, I don't think so. So that's the marker's approach to it. 
this is the second approach which is about individualism or that you be sad of the who's and there you can stand in, 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 in English I think standing alone is, is much stronger than that even you know it's, it means that you're a really really individual person <laughs> uh, but uh, these are the items that, or the questions the measures that were used uh, in Arnott's scale of individualism or being an adult yeah. accepting responsibility for the consequences of your actions that you, you know, uh, that you decide on your personal beliefs and values independent of your parents or other influences very strange, I think, because there are always influences, <laughs> and we decide our lives on the basis of those influences, very obviously. <laughs> so it's a very strange kind of thing. Uh, third one, establish a relationship with parents as an equal adult. That is, you know, you're not parent-child, you're equal. Uh, financially independent from parents, that you uh, don't uh, get money from them. And no, and the fifth one is a marker that we've looked at already, uh, no longer living in a par parent's household. These are the kind of five measures that uh, aren't used. Uh, now, items two, three, and four there, uh, we, we had trouble with in, in including them in this survey. Uh, we, had a, we were fortunate to have a, a, a group of young Indonesians who are PhD, uh, STIGA or STUA students in, in Canberra. And so we, we asked them about this, so we looked at how we would translate these things into Indonesian, and we decided we couldn't do it, you know, because it was not kind of culturally appropriate. The, the, it's not, in Indonesia, the aim is not to be kind of completely separate from parents, you know, not to break off all the relationship almost from parents. That's not the aim. I don't think it is in the United States either. But, <laughs> but uh, to break off relationships quite like that. Uh, or that you would, uh, um, uh, you know, that you might think of yourself as equal to your parent. It's kind of odd. You know, it's, your parents are your parents, you know. <laughs> you don't have to think of being, yourself as being equal to them, you know, because they're your parents. It's just a relationship. So, uh, so we had trouble with this. And so we decided that what was going on here was if you're looking at a kind of scale of dependence on parents, what was being measured here was the extreme, one extreme end, that is that you are extremely independent of your parents. You almost don't have a relationship with them. Yeah? And we didn't want to do that, so we thought we'd measure dependence on parents by looking at the other end of the scale and at rather the extreme dependence on parents. And we would define some questions that indicated extreme dependence on parents. And they were the ones that we came up with. Uh, I'm still emotionally dependent on my parents. Uh, my parents treat me as if I was still a child. So that's, very, that's extreme dependence. Uh, if I have a problem, I turn to my parents for help. That's not necessarily extreme. Uh, and then I consider myself to be an independent person. So we decided to use those four items in our survey. That's what we measured. Uh, they're the results. Uh, I'm, this one, I am still dependent on my parents. Uh, there's a bit of a mixture of answers there. This is disagree, those that say they're not dependent on their parents. These are the ones who say they are dependent on their parents. Uh, so there's, there's a bit of a mix there, which is a good thing when you're doing these kinds of measures, that you get a bit of a mix on the variables. Uh, my parents treat me as if I was still a child. Well, there's, that's, uh, you know, there's, there's maybe 16 or 17 percent of the, these ones are the ones who are not sure about it. <laughs> Maybe, maybe they do, maybe they don't. So uh, there's 16, 17 percent of young people who are a little bit in that category, and these are the ones who say that they're not and, uh, are treated by a child like a child. If I have a problem, I turn to my parents for help. That's much more. That's the one that's most common, and uh, it uh, looks like that. 
And finally, uh, this one is it's reversed. Uh, I consider myself to be a fully independent person. So these are the people who say yes. Uh, they, they're the ones who agree, the big one, that they do consider themselves to be independent. But these are the ones who say they, you know, they, they are not sure or they, they're not. That's, that's the distribution of it. So, uh, we put those together into a single scale which we call the scale of you know, dependence on parents. And we'll have a look at some results from that scale later on. The, the sense of control over one's life is a long concept in, uh, in psychology, a uh, sense of personal control. There's a measure, that a scale that was defined in 1966 by Rotter. Uh, and it's very commonly used. You'll find it in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of surveys. Uh, and so we decided we'd use that same scale. And we use the same scale. Uh, the items that we're using in this analysis, I have little control over the things that happen to me. What happens to me, what happens to me, not me, what happens to me in the future mostly depends on me. I can do just about anything if I really set my mind to it. There is really no way I can solve the problems I have. Sometimes I feel that I continue to be directed by the environment around me. That's, that's the sort of something around you that determines you. Now we, we did a, uh, a scale as well from those five measures. And the correlation between the parental independence and the sense of control was very low. That they weren't correlated, which suggests they're not measuring the same thing, uh, that they're measuring something different. Uh, they're not measuring, they're not both measuring adulthood, so uh, they're measuring something, something different. Uh, that's the, uh, those items in that scale, I won't go into that. So not as much variation, unfortunately, so it's not quite as good a scale, maybe. But uh, I don't know how a few people are into uh, uh, regressions, but here's the regressions. <laughs> This is parental dependence. The parental dependence scale is the dependent variable. Here are the locus of control is the dependent variable, and we're looking at the impact of these variables upon parental dependence. Uh, so uh, age is important, has, has some significance. Uh, that is, the older you are, the more independent you, you feel. Uh, Education, interestingly, is not, you know, it's a little bit, but not, not terribly strongly related to this parental independence measure, uh, interestingly. Uh, religion is also not very strongly related. Uh, those who migrated, uh, yes, the, those who migrated to Jakarta were, it's quite a strong relationship, significant relationship. They felt more independent from parents because they've left their parents when they were much younger, uh, a lot of them. Not all of them. Uh, but here's the uh, relationship with the markers. Uh, and there is a, there's a good strong relationship with parental, independ parental dependence, independence, uh, and ever having worked. So there's a, uh, that, that measure of working correlates quite strongly. Uh, left home also uh, that way. Uh, but the others, uh, th this is a regression, so, and these things tend to occur cumulatively, so the, the force of getting married might already have been taken by these, by leaving home, yeah? Uh, uh, this one is parental dependence or independent? Well, dependence, yeah, it doesn't matter, it's just a scale of parental. But, no, maybe I'm wrong. So, for those, who migrated since age 17, no, they are more dependent. No, they're more independent. <laughs> oh, sorry. So okay. maybe it should be, if you want to, independent might yes. be a better way to write yeah. the heading. Yeah. Yeah. So these are people who, who are more independent. Yeah. Dependence is the zero and independence is the one. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, so uh, from that we conclude that uh, 
And this relationship between ever working and parental dependence uh, probably is, and we conclude from the study, that that's probably the best way to measure adulthood from our study. That's the, that combination that you feel that you are independent of your parents and that you uh, are, uh, you're, have begun working. The other one, the locus of control, is quite different. Uh, Age, again, has the same kind of relationship, but uh, uh, roughly very, very, very similar, actually, for age. Uh, but now education has a very strong relationship. Uh, and uh, that means that if you're more educated, you have a greater sense of control over your life, uh, which must have back on. <laughs> that seems quite reasonable. But if you're more educated, you feel that you have more control over your life. Uh, so that's, uh, but, it, and the sense of control is strongly related. Uh, the next one down, interestingly, women who are uh, re religious uh, have a stronger sense of control over their lives than women who are not religious. Uh, and then, that's there. Then the markers really are not related to this sense of control. They're not very much related at all. Uh, so, uh, sense of control is not associated with markers. Sense of control is strongly really related to education. Uh, these are the things I've already said. Uh, one, the bottom one, we didn't have in that uh, table, but uh, men are less dependent upon parents and have a higher sense of control than women do. So there is a, a gender difference as well. Conclusions, the association between entering the workforce and a lower level of dependence upon parents, dependence upon parents, uh, low level of dependence, may be the best way to define adulthood in, among these young people. Uh, that's the not so much sense of control, not so much leaving home, etc. but those, those kinds of ways. And that's, that's the story. Uh, if, uh, we can take a few questions and we'll, uh, we'll look at the next one. Uh, where am I going? Down here? Yeah. 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 I, I have a question. Uh, I'm not so um, familiar with the scale or with the uh, demographic study. Yeah. So this is more of psycho and, uh, psychology. I see uh, one of you uh, um, folks finding that the more, more religious the woman, the more set control. Yeah. yeah. More sense of control. More sense of control. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain a bit what are the either? Any explanation of that? <laughs> right. Well, I can I can give an explanation, but the explanation would probably apply to men as well. You know? But so why are men different? Uh, uh, you know, an, uh, an explanation is that uh, religious people are able to explain the world in religious terms. Yeah? They don't have to explain it in any other way. Uh, they can explain the world in religious terms. And what's happening to them and so on can be explained in religious terms. Um, whereas somebody who's not so religious has to explain it in a lot of complicated ways. <laughs> uh, which means that they, over which they don't have much control. You know? uh, but that, that would be my idea. Uh, but to get a difference between men and women means that maybe the women who said they were religious were actually more religious than the men who said they were religious. <laughs> yeah, the cost is surprising. There's a difference between men and women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a religious thing, I suppose. So that's my suspicion. Maybe, maybe the maybe women are more likely. You know, religious women are more likely to rely solely on religion as an explanation of life. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Uh, than religious men or any men uh, or women who are not so religious. Yeah.
that's 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 the best explanation I can give. That's just a hypothesis. I haven't got any proof of that. But, yeah. I believe so. I mean, especially I mean, in in the, in, the, in the context of my neighborhood, for example, uh, most work, uh, but the people, I mean, the woman that is not working tend to associate themselves with a religious group in the neighborhood. In the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, and I, I'm not sure that there, is, that there is a connection, but recently there is a survey, there was a survey that said that the result of Indonesia is one of the happiest uh, states with the survey. Mm -hmm. And almost uh, at the same time, there's also a survey saying that Indonesia is the most the world, the most top part in the term of the religious mm -hmm. There is also other survey that says it's the most happiest countries. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that there's a collaboration of it, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not so this is really need, need more 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 uh, scrutiny. Mm -hmm. But I also we uh, we quote uh, yeah, yeah. You know, Karl Marx, so that religion is the opium of the people. Yeah. Uh, that is, uh, <laughs> if, if you are religious, you don't need anything else. Okay. <laughs> Martin is, is doing uh, research on religion, no? no? Yes. Okay. Uh, so basically, there is no clear cut that well, I compare with people that are more religious than who do not quite religious, so they uh, and then look at their behavior in contributing to the local public goods oh, well, for my for the first uh, result that I got. So there is no uh, significantly different their behavior. So basically people who, who are not religious enough it's basically they still want to contribute more. Uh, well mm. it's not so different from those who, who are religious. Who are religious. <laughs> Just okay, there's a, sorry, uh, there's a debate in the how I define religious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just ask them uh, how religious are you, you know, yeah. and yeah. with a scale. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So that's rank themselves. Objective scale, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the majority did not say they were very religious. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that was fairly rare, in fact. You know, the, the majority were up at the other end, mm -hmm. uh, not religious or somewhat religious. You know, uh, so. Yang jawab ekstrim sangat religius atau sangat tidak religius itu sedikit sekali. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And from my what is what, what is the scale of religious? Using? As I said, it's just a from one to five. Or one to five. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Seems to work okay. Though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, there was also an interesting study a few years ago in one of my, one of my colleagues doing a study on the effect or influence of religious uh, level, religious degree, hmm. to the uh, um, uh, participation in the natural resource conservation. Yeah. He found that there is a significant there's a significant correlation between a religious degree to the uh, to the um, uh, behavior of uh, more more um, Concerned to natural resource conservation. Right? All right. So mm -hmm. Positive correlation. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we also asked them if they were members of religious organisations that they participated in, and yeah. so on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but the the big group was Pengaji. Uh, Pengaji. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, members of other religious groups is fairly small. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, that's that story. Yeah. We can look for a question. No? More question? What? Okay. Is there any good uh, yeah, more, more, more uh, question? Did you have a question on ethnicity? Yes. Yeah, we do. Uh, because, uh, in, uh, for example, people from Padang or Batak, for example, yeah. they are more, they tend to migrate more. more and then they have some yeah. cult 
observer thing here. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can explain the degree of self control. Uh, why did, did, did you put the. Yeah, we haven't in? used ethnicity in this analysis, uh, that's true. Uh, the ethnic background of our sample is. Uh, Essentially, three places: uh, Japan, mm -hmm. lots of Batavia, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Java Tanga, I see, mm -hmm. and Java Bara. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and they make up quite a lot of the population of Japan. You know, the ones who come from outside of Java, uh, they, yeah, they're, they're there, but uh, uh, they tend to be selective as well. They tend to be a bit higher up. You know? uh, uh, more educated, etc. More more likely to be in higher occupations. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, the, the bulk of the people in Jakarta are from those uh, from Jakarta, uh, from uh, West Java or Central Java. Uh, at this age group, I'm going to talk about the migrants. Uh, okay. so. <laughs> I've probably got that table here. Okay. <laughs> We're interested in what the outcomes were for migrants to Jakarta, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, we divided up, this is the origins of the sample, uh, lived in Jakarta all of their, in Dekai, all of their life, 38%, lived uh, percent Bekasi all of their life, Tangerang all of their life, or they moved only between Jakarta, Bekasi and Tangerang. There's quite a lot of movement. Uh, uh, out of, it's primarily out of Jakarta into Bekasi and Tangra. Uh, for a long period of time, not, not, yeah, not yeah. only looking. Yeah, no, no, this is for a long, this, they, yeah. they've moved their residence. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and so 59% of the sample fitted into that category, that they were born in Jakarta and they just moved around within Jakarta to Bekasi and Tangra. And then moving from Central Java is the next biggest group, moving from West Java, uh, moving from another province to uh, Greater Jakarta, just 10% uh, from coming outside of any out of other province other than Central Java and West Java, uh, including East Java, in you know, that 10%. Um, and then we had some people who moved around a lot, and they moved out of Jakarta to you know, another province, and then they'd come back, etc. And they made up about 8% of the sample who moved around quite a bit. But all in all, migrants constituted 41% of the population of our population in Jakarta. So you know, quite a big proportion of the population are, are migrants to Jakarta in their own lifetime. Uh, the, uh, we decided that we were going to look at this by age. I think we probably fell on this by accident. <laughs> it was maybe not our theory to begin with. But we discovered that there's a big difference according to the age of education to Jakarta. Age, age, sorry, age when you move to, to Jakarta. Uh, this is, shows you the education of their fathers, which we asked. And you see those who move under the age of 10, in the second column there, uh, moving under the age of 10, their education distribution is very similar to the non-migrants. So they came as children, uh, and then they were educated in Jakarta, and they were, uh, they look very similar to the, those who, who were born in uh, Jakarta. Uh, and we investigated and we found that, you know, of course, if they're moving under the age of 10, they're extremely likely to have moved with their parents, uh, not, not on their own. Uh, so they're just children moving with their parents to Jakarta, and they have school, and they don't look any different. But if they moved in this age range, between the ages of 10 and 17, their, their education distribution is very low. Uh, and that's because they are in a village somewhere, uh, they have having problems continuing in school, usually financial problems. You know, it's, it's, about the, it's about the capacity to remain in school. Uh, and so they make the decision that they're leaving school early and they're moving to Jakarta. Uh, it's a, like a joint decision, a sim simultaneous decision. I leave school, I go to Jakarta. Uh, from our case studies, we found that those who move to Jakarta are often doing it 
they know somebody in Jakarta, there is often a family member, like a sister, or, or is already in Jakarta, and so they're not coming into Jakarta cold, they're coming in and they stay initially with, with their relative in Jakarta, and, may, and then they're getting a job. Uh, as we'll show here, people in, who arrive between the ages of 10 and 7, 17, are usually going into very low level jobs with no, no skills, low skill jobs, no skill jobs, unskilled jobs. Those coming after 17 are a bit of a mix. Uh, you know, some of them are coming from another province and they're quite well educated. Uh, others are, uh, are not educated. So they're, they're, they're a bit of a mix of the, of the two. Uh, this uh, 10 to 17 group were the interesting group who had very low education. Well, and here we just put together the 10 and over group because of the numbers issue. Uh, very few economic opportunities available in the village of origin. In the case studies, they often say they didn't want to work in the Sahara. <laughs> uh, you know, they've got a bit of education, and they say they didn't want to work in the Sahara. Yeah. And, and their sister in Jakarta is kind of doing reasonably well, so they, they would go to Jakarta. You know, they'd have that aspiration. Uh, so they set out for Jakarta. Uh, when I say on their own, they, they usually have a relative in Jakarta, but meaning that not with their parents, they move without their parents. The men worked as street sellers, women often as domestic servants, as you might guess. Uh, in general, they remain self-employed uh, or as casual workers, and they work very long hours uh, at very low wage rates. Uh, and they had little opportunity to continue their education once they moved to the city because they didn't have any money and couldn't go back to school. Uh, this shows you the, uh, the schooling history of the different groups. Uh, this is showing them still being in school, essentially. And so some of them here are still in school when they're 30, 25 or something. But uh, this is the group I was talking about that uh, moved between 10 and 17. So they drop out of school quite early. Uh, you know, by 15, 16, they're out of school. And uh, that's, that's very different to the other groups. Uh, the other groups continue their education. That's, uh, that, was, that was males. This one is females. Uh, even lower, in fact, uh, here. Uh, drop out uh, at an earlier age even. Uh, and these are your, this is the Kalm for Bantu Ruma, largely, who uh, come out of central Java and uh, come into Jakarta as, as, as for Bantu Ruma at a young age. Uh, uh, but we also find that uh, they don't stay long in that occupation and uh, they, they get out of that occupation by for coming on by marrying. <laughs> Here's the proportion never married, speaking about marriage. And uh, this group, the 10 to 17 group, you see they marry at a much younger age. Uh, they, don't, they don't come with husbands to Jakarta. Uh, they come to Jakarta when they're single. Uh, and as I say, they work in domestic service and in low level jobs, other low level jobs. But they get married quite quickly. Uh, that's the that's the result. Whereas the others are all following a, an older uh, age at, at marriage. Uh, uh, except for the, this mixed group is the 17 uh, and over group. So we looked at uh, what are the odds of being in a low occupation. Low level occupation was decided defined as a process worker, an operator or machine assembly worker, so we were including the factory workers, or those in elementary occupations, those who had uns totally unskilled type occupations. Uh, and uh, migrating after age 10 uh, was a strong determinant of being in a low level occupation for women. Uh, their age didn't matter, but uh, obviously their education was also very important. Uh, the, the determinant of working in a, in a, 
uh, in a low level occupation. So this one is well, of course, uh, for the uh, junior high school or less. If you get more education than junior high school, then uh, you've got a very strong chance of not working in a low level occupation. Although in another paper we find that so there's quite a lot of underemployment among those with senior high school, uh, those who are senior high school graduates in Jakarta, uh, particularly men, a lot of them are working in quite low level jobs. Uh, for women, they're, they're working in the retail sector, so that's maybe not quite so low. Uh, that, that's the opportunity for women, just to work in the retail sector, if you have SMR. Uh, but uh, for, for men, they were working as object drivers, a lot of them were working as object drivers, and who uh, were and so on, so even with an SMR. Uh, Vulnerability mobility of women migrating to Jakarta from age 10 onwards. Women who migrated to Jakarta from 10 onwards had disadvantage in multiple ways. Uh, they had by far the lowest levels of education and the lowest levels of employment of anybody in the sample, those who moved to uh, Jakarta from age 10 onwards, and they were women. Uh, they marry uh, early and have children at early ages. Uh, and if they were working in low-level occupations, uh, so uh, a kind of level of vulnerability or disadvantage associated with that. Uh, and more than 50% of employed women in that category were employed as domestic workers or self-employed petty traders, and another 20% were working in the factories. Uh, the factories were the reason that we chose to include Kotamaja Pakasi and Kotamaja Tangara to, to increase that kind of group within the sample, those who are working in factories. Uh, for men migrating to Jakarta at ages 10 on, uh, they were actually more likely to be employed than other men, uh, and also, but they worked much longer hours than other men. Uh, and that was consistent with their need for income, that they had to get money from somewhere, so they were working, and they worked long hours. Uh, but then we did an analysis where we took uh, uh, education into account. We, we controlled for human capital. Here we're looking for discrimination. Huh? So, uh, we controlled for the human capital because the migrants had a lower level of ed education, uh, and we took into account the type of work they did. Uh, and uh, we actually found that the hourly wage rate of the migrants was a little bit higher than other men. So this is after you control for all the human capital, the fact that they have low human capital and they're working in low-level jobs. If, if, you, if you look at other men in the same kind of situation, uh, the migrants actually had a higher wage rate than the, uh, the non-migrants. And uh, that's... Uh, uh, an interesting thing. If it's purely, if you think of it as discrimination, then it's positive discrimination. That, those, uh, that is, that the, the employers actually pr preferred migrants uh, in those, once you control for all those characteristics. Uh, and, uh, you know, that may, might be the case. Uh, uh, maybe migrants are prepared to work harder, and that might be recognized by employers. Uh, because they, you know, they, they don't have support from other, they don't have support from other places. You know, they don't have maybe support from their parents living in Jakarta or whatever. Uh, so they have to work harder. Uh, they maybe migration is selective for people, and this is a, a standard theory about migration. You know that migration is selective for people who have some uh, want to get ahead, want to get on, and they do that through migration. Uh, uh, maybe they don't have family in Jakarta, as I said. Maybe they have demands upon them as well, that they have to send money back to the village as remittances. And we, we've got information in the survey on that. Uh, and there's quite a lot of uh, money. A lot of the, our respondents provide money to their parents. Uh, that's quite very, was very common. Um, and also, uh, we've, as we've found that their wives are not likely to be working. If their wives are also migrants, they're not likely to be earning. And so they might have to work harder. So that may be why the migrants have this, this positive, uh, higher wage rate. Uh, 
So as education levels increase across Indonesia and young people in villages don't drop out of school at an early age, this pool of low school migrants might start to get a little bit less common. Uh, so what happens you know, if you can't get a Pabantu Ruma uh, in Jakarta or, or they, their, their level of education goes up? So it, yeah, it's, it's a wage rate thing, that, so that the Pabantu Ruma start to cost more <laughs> uh, as, as their, labor, their supply starts to diminish and as they have higher education and they can shop around. Uh, and that's the story which that happened in the West uh, you know, over time until the occupation very largely disappeared, except for the very, very wealthy uh, who could afford to have household assistance. Uh, so that has some implications, I think, for the future. Okay. So, you, so you're saying it's, it will be more difficult to find in the month of mind? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's time, that's time. That's time. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and uh, you know, well, there's also the competition from people going uh, working overseas as well now. You know? It's supposed to be six million Indonesians now working overseas, and a lot of them come from the same market. You know, they're, they're people who might have been from Bantaruma. Uh, and they've gone to the Middle East to be a be from Bantaruma, and they get a lot more money there than they would here. <laughs> they be outsourcing. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's one clarification of, uh, I mean, the, from the regression uh, result. Do you also support the, whether they migrate by themselves or with their parents? Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have that information directly. Uh, we had it indirectly by looking at whether they were still living with their parents. Uh, yeah. So they're migrants. Uh, some of them are still living with their parents. That means they migrated with it. They had to have migrated with their parents. Uh, but we don't have the exact detail. But we're, we're pretty confident, you know, that uh, uh, that those who migrate in that age range, 10 to 17, and we looked at it with, from a lot of different perspectives. Although we didn't measure it directly, we, we checked against a lot of other measures. We know we're, we're pretty confident the vast majority of them came without their parents uh, in that age range. So that's the different category mm -hmm. that we made. Is also significant when they migrate, you know, mm -hmm. in early stage of life, they migrate with their parents. The, so we're having this uh, article published in the uh, journal, the Asian Population Asian Studies. Asian Population Studies. Uh, and as I said, uh, uh, yeah. We, we kind of found it a bit by accident <laughs> yeah. that this, there was this very strong age factor involved. Yeah. Uh, because other studies that look at migration don't, don't look at age. Yeah. Uh, the age at which the, they say they migrated as to the city as a child, you know, under the age of 20. Yeah. But, but here we find very, very big differences according, under the age of 20 according to what age you actually moved. You know. And that's that's what the paper's about. Yeah. So the the age uh, group being related significantly with the outcome mm. of their education and employment. Yeah. Of yeah. the migrant education and employment. Well, it's education. No, they they sitting they're in the village. Yeah. They've, they've, their parents have financial problems. Um, they've got some education. They don't want to go to the work in the Sahara. Uh, and so, and they've got a sister in Jakarta, and so they go to Jakarta. That's 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 the kind of story. general general story. Yeah. And that comes out of our uh, case study, case studies, so which you can read some of them in there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now the last one that I was going to talk about is one that's probably the most interest to economists, <laughs> uh, which is about poverty. It's not in the handout. Oh, I know. So, but is it on here? Uh, yeah. yeah. 
So if you know any funding agency <laughs> that would support our study, please let us know. <laughs> Now, this uh, research is very recent. Uh, we, we presented this in Bafanas uh, yesterday for the first time. It hasn't been presented anywhere before. Uh, and it's still somewhat work in progress. Uh, but so, uh, of course, from a study like this, we're interested in measuring poverty or disadvantage or inequality. You know, we, we want to measure those things. Uh, and uh, we, you can think of poverty having three uh, possible uh, definitions that are in the literature. There's kind of the notion of well-being, uh, and that how healthy are you, uh, what is your psychological well-being, uh, that, that how happy are you. No? That's in the literature now. Economists only work on happiness these days. You know, they, don't, <laughs> they don't measure anything else. No? Uh, <laughs> uh, so well-being is one kind of concept. Uh, there's uh, Amartya Sen's uh, kind of capability approach uh, that you have uh, education, human capital, uh, that you have an opportunity structure. You know, you're able to, uh, you have resources that you can, uh, capabilities, and, and so it's about opportunities rather than reality. You know that you have the opportunity to, to go ahead. And the third and the most usual concept of uh, poverty is just the material standard of living. So we have poverty lines like one dollar a day purchasing power. Um, how many are below that and how many are above it or two dollars a day or one dollar fifty a day. Uh, that's a kind of poverty line uh, type measure. Uh, and that's the kind of thing you get in Indonesia. Uh, but so uh, we, we're going to look at number three. Uh, defining poverty as a very low material living standard uh, along with the, the standard convention. Now, poverty can be measured, uh, you can also think of poverty at a household level or at an individual level. And uh, yeah, you, poverty is usually measured at the household level, that you get household income and you get, or you get household expenditure and you control that for the household structure using a, an equivalent scale, uh, you know, whether the, what, what, how many people and what their ages are, etc. Uh, and you get a measure uh, of uh, equivalent income or equivalent expenditure, uh, and you can uh, then say this household is poor and this house, household is not poor. That's the, the, the standard way of measuring it, that's the way that DPS does it, etc. Um, but uh, it is possible to think that uh, you might live in a rich household, but you're not rich yourself. You know? That's that's possible. With the household income inequality. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you might you might happen to have a wealthy husband, say, but he doesn't he, he doesn't give you any money at all. <laughs> no, that, that doesn't happen in Indonesia. Oh, it doesn't happen. In, <laughs> That never happens. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, you might have a wife who takes all your money and she doesn't give you any. That happens. No, that <laughs> so that's the more common situation. Um, but in our own study, our study was a study of individuals. We didn't study households. We, we studied one person, we sampled one person in each household who, who was in our age range. The way we did our sample was we, we picked, uh, we chose Kalurahan first, to cut Kalurahan, probability proportional to size, mm -hmm. the chance of getting in. Then we chose uh, Ete, uh, so uh, 30 uh, Kalurahan from, from these areas. In each Kalurahan, 10 ERT, so we had 300 ERT. Uh, we then went out and we did a census of those 300 ERT. So that was where, where it cost us money. Uh, we, we did a full census uh, of those uh, uh, 300 ERT. Uh, and we, then we got a whole list of people who were aged 20 to 34 from our census, and we did a random sample of them, uh, but we chose 11 11 people per air uh, And only one per household. Yeah, and only one per household. So if it was husband and wife, 
uh, say, Prasanda, we haven't changed my novel, not, not, not both of them, uh, but at random. Mm -hmm. So that was how the sample was done. So it's a sample of individuals, and we don't have household income or household expenditure. Uh, if you ask a young person, say, age 22, living at home with parents, what's your father's income? They don't know. They don't know. So you can't, you can't uh, do a household survey in that way. You can't get household income in that way. Uh, so what we we were then forced not to use household income or household expenditure, but look at another way of measuring poverty, and that is measures what are called measures of deprivation. If you've done if you've done any poverty work. Uh, You'll find this kind of measure used in literature primarily from the Nordic countries, uh, from, from places like Sweden, uh, or from the United Kingdom, uh, measures of deprivation. Uh, and uh, so that's what we're doing. We, we, we have a lot of measures in our study that were, were possible indicators of deprivation. So we're going to have a look at all of those possible measures and then test them out whether they are good measures of poverty or not. That's, that's what the paper is about. So here's, I'm going to show you uh, 24 measures that we looked at as candidate measures of deprivation, possibly deprivation. The first uh, list are characteristics of the dwelling. And these were all questions that were in the 2010 census of Indonesia, in fact. So we just took the same questions. Uh, the type of dwelling, uh, Ruma Patak, or there were also people in the study who weren't living in a house at all, weren't living in a dwelling at all. They were living in the, in the market or somewhere. So that they were also included here as, as being poor. Uh, and you can see that the percentage deprived if you use that as a measure of deprivation, uh, is 22%. We're in that kind of situation. Then we looked at uh, meters per person, the space that you have within the dwelling, and we took a level uh, of seven and a half meters. Uh, that's like, I'm, uh, I'm almost two meters, yeah, so <laughs> lay me down on the ground this way and that way, yes. and a little bit more, and that's how much space we're talking about for the person. And that includes everything, of course. It's, uh, for and it's 25%. 25% were in the category. Yeah. Uh, had less than seven and a half meters. That's uh, so. <laughs> 30%. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you know, that's, that, that is for everything. That's, uh, 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 so they, you know, as, as Evil describes, they have their kitchen in a box, you know. They have a roll-up bed, etc. So <laughs> that's that kind of situation. We looked at persons per bedroom, uh, having three or more. Uh, three or more means you know it might be husband and wife and a baby, and that's probably not such a problem. So this is why. I'm, yeah. Sorry, uh, this cup of uh, is. Uh, Quite well established in the research. No, 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 these were cutoffs. These were cutoffs in most cases that we have decided. Okay, so uh, more ad hoc. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we had, because there's not much literature in right. this developing country context on this deprivation mm -hmm. approach, uh, we've, we've decided upon these ourselves. Uh, in the case of the, the second one, the meters per person. We didn't know any standard there, and and what we we actually deliberately ch chose 25 percent. That was as as what wherever the 25 percent was going to come, that's where we decided we'd put the the, the marker. Uh, that's not the case with any of the others, but just with that one, we uh, persons per bedroom, three or more, maybe it could have been four or more. I don't know, but then you you know, if it. Because we're dealing with young people, you know, and maybe they haven't had a baby yet, you know, there's a couple without a baby, well, you can't actually get four or more, or three or more, so uh, we, we settled on three. The floor material, a bit more straightforward, uh, but uh, <clears throat> they have soil, bamboo, wood, or cement brick floors, uh, uh, and that was 12.5%. Uh, 
the source of drinking water uh, was essentially an outside source. Uh, they have a tap or a well outside of the house or some other source, nothing within the house. Uh, and uh, interestingly in Jakarta, 50% uh, of the population buys their drinking water. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't use the, any local source for their drinking water, they buy it in. Uh, so it's very, very big, <laughs> quite high. Uh, ownership of the house, whether the house is rented or, or, or built on illegal land, 25% um, roughly, uh, were owned or uh, were rented or on Education and work is the, uh, uh, the capability kind of measure, really. Uh, we looked at the years from ages 12 to 17, and how many of those years were you not working or not studying? But that is, you are sitting at home, you are idle. <laughs> uh, and we took three or more years as indicating uh, disadvantage, because uh, you know, sometimes they might spend one year out. But uh, uh, so 16%. Uh, and then uh, highest education level, uh, and uh, never went to school or completed primary school. Unemployed is, is the formal definition of unemployment. You know that you were not working last week for one hour at least, uh, that you were looking for work uh, and you were ready to work. You know, a very formal definition of unemployment, 8%. Uh, the other ones, we asked some questions around finances and assets, whether they live their level of satisfaction with their finance, finances, the level of satisfaction with the amount of their savings, the, the self-assessment of their financial situation, whether it was uh, good or uh, good, uh, inadequate or very inadequate. You can see the percentages there, I won't read them out. Uh, <coughs> interestingly, we thought in this day and age, uh, mobile phone or cellular phone was an in interesting measure. Uh, and only 15% of the sample did not have a a cell phone or a mobile phone, only 15% of our sample. <laughs> uh, Interesting. And uh, car and motorbike ownership, uh, and more than 50% had a car or a motorbike as well. Uh, uh, um, but they were unable to pay their bills in the last 12 months, uh, they were uh, unable to pay their rent in the last 12 months, or they'd sold something because they were short of money sold or pawned something uh, because they needed the money, uh, or that they had gone without food uh, at some time in the, uh, in the last 12 months, uh, that they had gone without food, uh, or that they couldn't purchase new clothes. So they were, uh, you can see the numbers again. Finally, on the health measures, the, the body mass index, uh, were they underweight? Uh, and 21% of Jakartans are underweight. Uh, the, whether they rated their health as fair or poor, whether they had a chronic illness or not. Uh, emotional support, we asked them, uh, there was a list of 11 people, two types of people, where you might get emotional or support or advice. And we asked them how many, which of those that they got the support from. And this is people who got it from less than, from two or few, two or, or less. You, know, the, you could have had 11 sources, you know, but they, they only had two or, or fewer than two. And then their life, their overall life satisfaction, where they, uh, uh, maybe they were dissatisfied with life. <coughs> okay, so how do you test whether those things are reliable or not? Uh, well, we can look at it against age and sex. Age, 20 to 24, 25, 29, 30 to 34, sex, male, female. Poverty, a good poverty measure should not be related to age or sex. You know, it should be more absolute. It shouldn't change with age or change with, with, uh, with sex. So we, that was one of the criteria. But it should also be associated with factors which you think might lead to poverty. Like, and the one we, we preferred was the economic, <coughs> your economic status when you were growing up. What was the economics? Was it poor or was it really good? No. Uh, and this is based on the theory of intergenerational transfer of disadvantage, which is universal, happens in every country. Uh, that if you come from a poor background, you don't do as well 
uh, as if you come from a, a higher background. So we use those for reliability uh, tests in a multivariate model. Uh, and uh, here we see the dwelling and financial uh, measures. And you expect this to rise, to, to be significant and to rise. Uh, that is, you're more likely to, uh, if your economic situation when you were growing up was poor, uh, then you're more likely to be poor by these other measures, okay? Uh, and, you know, they're, they're, they're quite, usually quite strong in this list here. So two and a half times more likely to be poor if you had a poor background from the type of dwelling. More likely to be living in a room of Petah, etc., etc. And meters and the person's floor material they all go in the right direction. Some of them are you know, much stronger, like here with the satisfaction with the financial ones tend to be stronger here. Mobile phone ownership is quite strong, very strong, uh, which is again suggesting maybe it's not a bad measure, probably. <laughs> uh, car and motorbike ownership, not quite so strong. Uh, but all of these, the purchasing food one uh, was uh, purchasing food is quite strong at the poor end, but not, there was here, so it wasn't significant, even though it's in the right direction. And I think that's probably because of kind of small numbers, because there weren't all that many who were, uh, had a problem with food. So all of those look pretty good uh, on that criterion. Uh, here's the other ones, and most of these don't look so good, except for the education ones, where again you expect that there's a strong relationship between education and and your material standard of living, and it's very, very strong here. And it's the strongest of all of the variables. Uh, but, uh, and uh, the, uh, but the ones that are in yellow, the formal unemployment is not associated with, with your background at all. Uh, and this is, I think, related to the fact that you can only afford to be unemployed in a formal sense if you come from a relatively high background. Uh, if you are poor and in Jakarta, then you've got to be out there making some money somehow. You know, you can't just sit back and be unemployed. Uh, so that uh, I think that's the reason. And the health measures also are not very much, uh, not strongly related uh, to the to the parental the, the parental background, the economic situation. Uh, and you know, we could go into the reasons for that, but. Uh, Essentially, they, they don't relate very strongly, or they're related in the wrong direction, or whatever. Now, looking at things in another way, education and employment also are capability measures rather than material living standard, and health is, is a well-being measure rather than uh, material living standard. So, in other words, we've dropped all of these on this page as not being appropriate. Uh, and. Uh, <coughs> Uh, two of the indicators, this is the fourth dot point, two indicators, owning a motor vehicle and having difficulty paying rent were related to age, uh, fairly strongly related to age. You're, more, uh, you're kind of more likely to, uh, if you're older, you're more likely to be in your own house and not in your parents' house. Uh, and so that was why you had more difficulty paying rent, uh, just because of that. <laughs> so we dropped. <laughs> So we decided we'd drop those two variables as well. Uh, and that left us with 14 indicators that we, out of the 24 that we started with, which we thought were reliable. That's the 14 there. They're all dwelling, the six dwelling measures all came through, and most of the finance and assets measures. Uh, then we, we scored people, we just added up over the 14. How many of those disadvantages does a person have? Uh, adding up the total. And uh, we had nobody in the sample who had all 14. But we had one, who, one person who had 13 of the 14 <laughs> disadvantages. Uh, now, in a, measure, in a measure of disadvantage of this type, this is the distribution, the kind of distribution that you hope to get. That most people are down this end, that is, they're not disadvantaged. Uh, and there's a couple of steps here, one there and one here. Uh, and so we thought we'd make use of those steps uh, and say that these people here, six, and a, six or more dis disadvantages, were very disadvantaged or poor. 
Uh, and this group here with four or five disadvantages, they were disadvantaged, uh, and the other group, naught to three, were not disadvantaged. So that's the measure we're, we're playing with at this point in time, uh, as that we think will work. And it seems that it holds up pretty well. Uh, Here's another test of it. Uh, this is percentage, this is each one of them, uh, each one of the 14, what percentage, uh, percent disadvantage for each item. The blue one for four plus, uh, deprivate, the group who had four plus, and the group who had six plus, these are the ones we say are poor. Uh, and it follows a nice pattern, which it should do. The, the red ones, the red bars should be longer than the blue bars, you know? not the reverse, they all are in that kind of way. Uh, and interestingly, the ones that are the hardest, you know, the ones that are the least common, uh, but are the hardest end, the four hardest ends are the four basic needs. Food, water, clothing, and shelter. Okay, the four basic needs, and that's, that's another good result, I think, you know, that the four basic needs sit there on the top. Uh, and the, but then the mobile phone comes as number five. <laughs> so we, we look, this is looking good. Then we say, well, look at our three categories, not disadvantaged, disadvantaged, very disadvantaged, uh, relationship with education. It looks very, very good. You know, it's a, what you would expect. You get a strong relationship with education. Uh, here's the relationship with the one we looked at before, the economic situation when you were growing up. Again, you get a strong and expected relationship. Uh, so we think our measure is looking quite good as a, as a, a, a way to measure the variation in material well-being within, within the sample. Uh, <coughs> Applications, well, we can use this in our own study to look at uh, explanations of being poor or not poor. Uh, you know, what, have a bigger model then of what, what is poor and who's, who's poor and what's, who's not poor. Well, those who came from a disadvantaged background but now are not poor, you know, what, why was that? We can look at that kind of question. Uh, and we can also, when we get longitudinal about the study, look at how change occurred. You know? So that the poor in this in this round in 2010, we go back in 2013 and they're not poor. No. Well, what's what's the cause? No. What caused that change? So that's how we hope to use the use the data. Okay. So is there any questions? Just for for clarification, yeah. do you divide the. the um, Respondents uh, into three uh, categories. Yeah? Uh, scale one, uh, zero to three is not disadvantage. Huh? Yeah. Is it expert judgment or is there other, other consideration there? Uh, well, it was based, as I said, primarily on these steps. Uh, that uh, there, there's, there's quite a big step down there. Uh, I see. Uh, and here again, there's quite another step down. You know? So they're kind of cutting points, you know? Yeah. They're kind of natural cutting points in the distribution. That's why we chose those points primarily. But we can reassess. There are other ways of reassessing this, which we, we haven't had time to do yet. But. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, we're back. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the these are the fourteen. Uh, in in some other parts of Indonesia, the nature of the dwellings is different. You know. Uh, and maybe you might have a problem uh, with these measures. Uh, the finance ones are probably okay, you know, but maybe in some parts of Indonesia, mobile phone ownership might not be appropriate. Uh, in general, though, you know, I would try to use these, yeah, in another part of Indonesia, uh, to see whether they they look okay or not. Yeah. But you know we've defined the set for Jakarta for our sample. Yeah. 
and maybe, and this is an urban population too, by the way. Yeah. Not a rural, not a, not, yeah, they're, they're not farmers, you know. So if, if you've got farmers, then you'll be looking at how much land they own or no land or, you know, how much work do they get and so on. No, but uh, uh, for this group, I think uh, for Jakarta, you know, for an urban area, this is more, this is appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to contact uh, me, uh, I'll send you the questions you know, the, in Indonesian upon which these are based uh, so that you can use the same kind of wording per question. I do have a question. This, this is about the linear relationship between indicators. Well, uh, when I see, especially for the, the subjective satisfactory level, it seems that satisfaction with finances will be highly correlated with the satisfaction with amount of savings. In other words, Basically, both indicators mm. show the same thing, right? Well, possibly, yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually did some factor analysis of those uh, 14, which I've got in this last point here, and they divided up into four factors. Uh, one was the dwelling, and so all the dwelling characteristics yeah. are kind of related to each other too. Uh -huh. So, and they form one factor. Uh, satisfaction with finances, just sort of like you were saying. Uh, they were kind of correlated with each other and made one factor. Uh, access to basic necessities and ownership of, uh, and finally ownership of basic amenities. So, so we had, came out with, with four, four factors, mm -hmm. meaning that the items that were in those factors were related to each other, mm -hmm. as, you're, as you're suggesting. Yeah. Um, but uh, if you look at it as a single factor, the, the 14 items, uh, it, uh, where, where they, they weight, if you put them as a, as a factor in a factor analysis, they get weights. You know? yeah. when, when I counted them up, they, they, they all have the same weight. Yeah. Uh, but if you put them in a factor analysis, they get a different weight. Uh, but we found that the correlation between the factor mm -hmm. across the 14 items and just simply adding them up was 0.99. <laughs> so it didn't matter. <laughs> didn't matter. Uh, so weights, weights made no difference. But, uh, but you, here, what, you know, you can think of poverty having four dimensions. Uh, by this factor approach. One is the dwelling, then uh, satisfaction with finance, access to basic necessities, that's the food, clothing, water, etc. And then ownership of basic amenities was, that's where the mobile phone was, and so on. So uh, you can think of poverty being divided up into those four kind of dimensions with this measure. We better go to it. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, unless you want to stay longer. Just, just, uh, <laughs> just curious. Uh, you said that, if I'm not mistaken, I heard that, or well, maybe you, you said that you will do the, into the, what the, yes. final, the final, yes. final, yes. Yeah. and then this one will be included yeah. in the, yeah. and this is the, the same respondent. So this one is the first me. phase? Yeah, mm. this is the first phase. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I would like to have a data in the net because there is such a rich information. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It's all aspect of your life. Yeah. Exactly. Because and I, then, I assume that you are under 34. Exactly. And then, yeah. and then, I mean, I see that <laughs> he almost looks at the hood. <laughs> 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 so we, we, we deliberately took a kind of whole of life approach yeah. to this. Uh, we measured almost everything about <laughs> Political aspect, religious aspect, marriage, from, uh, reproductive health, work, be, yeah. education, migration. Because I'm, I'm working on the human behavior, <clears throat> okay. in, uh, especially in the, in the area of a public good profession. 
activities. So, and then I start looking at the other aspects uh, besides the economic aspect, like yeah. sociological aspect, yeah. psychological as aspect, yeah. things like that. We have a lot of uh, measure on values as well. World values, values about Obama, <laughs> okay. about the environment as well. And gender values. And gender values. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I don't know how to deal with this because it's only how many minutes now? Yes. How more is that we Huh? <laughs> 10 minutes? Yes. Whoa, that's a bit, a bit hard. Uh, maybe, I don't know how to start. Should I start with this one or with the very brief? Political background, I mean political affiliation, religious affiliation, uh, or maybe I just go through it, right? Yes. Okay, then. So first I want to present about how, how important it is uh, to have reproductive health services for those who are still single. Why I mention this? Because in our law, in our population and development law and family welfare, it is stated that family planning and reproductive health services are only for those who are still um, who are married, not those who are single. So this is uh, the argument for for this, and we know by the fact that the government see young people see <laughs> as like a non-sexual being so everybody is behaving very well and even though the government acknowledges that uh, HIV is a, is a problem but they don't they don't provide education or services relating to reproductive health uh, so I just skip that. <laughs> so this is this is the problem that we are facing more and more. Um, you know, for example, in the second case, uh, there are more and more cases that young people find uh, uh, find out about their future spouse uh, who have HIV and what 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 should she do, and uh, and then. Uh, also, it's an inequality treatment for for those who are still single if they experience pregnancy. For example, all the blame would go to the girl, and and you can smile and walk around without any you know, without any blame. But it's, it's the girl who are who are stigmatized. And also not just the girl, but the family. So this is this is uh, reality, uh, and and the boy can just you know be free as uh, as he has not done anything. So I just moved this because of the time. Uh, so this is from our sample. Uh, from our Greater Jakarta Transition to Adulthood Survey. So if you concentrate on the never married, you know, 16% uh, they, uh, they have uh, uh, sex before married. Uh, and, then, and then also you see here is quite interesting that uh, uh, self masturbation among male is is uh, quite high compared to female, but then female and male they they do masturbation with their partner uh, among unmarried. <laughs> but you see here, you see here that the difference between premarital sex among male and female is, is quite high, that is 16% compared to 5% among female. But we found out something that is very different. It turned out that the female are more likely to not be honest about their sexual behavior, premarital sexual behavior, comparing to male. 
And this is, uh, we asked about lifetime number of sexual partner. And the majority is, is one, you know. And uh, we also conduct a study in four different countries, including Indonesia, uh, but among women, that is in Yogyakarta, uh, in Indonesia, and then in Thailand, Mozambique, and, and South Africa. And we have the lowest number of lifetime sexual partner. And I also